Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Maxime Report from Bootlin, and I've been working on a, on a video codec, um, so to be able to do video hardware coding on a null winner platform, so an ARM SOC. And I'm going to talk a bit about um, how did we manage to make it work and how it's going to work in the next um, kernel releases, because it's something that is brand new. So first, let me introduce myself. Um, so I've been an embedded engineer at Bootlin for the last seven years and a half. Um, and basically, we're doing embedded Linux development um, and embedded Linux training. Um, and I've been contributing a lot um, as part of this job. So I'm the co-maintainer of the old winner SOC support in, in Linux um, for exactly six years now. Uh, we started working on it at ELC 2012, so it's awesome. Um, and I've been for like a couple of weeks um, the co-maintainer of the DRM MISC subsystem, which is basically the um, subsystem responsible for the um, um, graphical stack in Linux um, and the MISC part being basically everything that is not NVIDIA, Intel, or AMD. Um, and I've been contributing to a lot of open source projects over the time. Um, so build root, U-boot, bare box, um, and so on. So uh, let's get started on video decoding. Um, so first, we need to talk a bit about um, what an encoded, an encoded video is. Uh, and it's basically two things. Um, you usually will have, um, so the file itself um, will not be the video itself. It's first a container. So the container will be basically the format that is used to um, organize within that file um, the video streams, the audio streams, um, and some other metadata, for example, the subtitles, and so on. So it's basically how the file is laid out to um, store all the um, streams and data that are, well, basically what you can expect when you are playing this video. And then you have one or multiple codecs, if you have video and audio, um, which will encode um, the data that need to be stored um, in a compressed format so that you can have a, yeah, a decent file size and not blow your um, hard disk because you, are, you have like two or three video files. Um, so we are only going to talk a bit we are only going to talk about the codec itself. Uh, we are not going to talk about containers because as far as the video hardware uh, accelerators are concerned, the containers are really not important. Uh, it's usually the video player or one of its libraries that will extract the video stream uh, from, the, from, the, from the file and pass it to the decoder. So yeah, we are only going to talk about the codec. And um, the codec basically relies on something that is called a bitstream. Um, and the Wikipedia definition for it isn't very helpful. So the bitstream, if you look at Wikipedia, is basically a sequence of bits. Great. Um, but in the context of codecs, um, it basically is a compressed output of the encoder. So it's going to be your encoded video data um, that is sitting on your hard disk when you have downloaded or encoded a video. And it's mainly composed of three things. Um, so we are talking in general here. Uh, some more advanced codecs have more um, things in the, in the bitstream. But basically, you will always find a separator between frames so that you are able, um, by just reading that stream of bits, um, to tell which, um, when a frame starts and when a frame stops. Um, then the metadata, which are holding the compression parameters. Um, so for example, one of these parameters might be the references of the image um, that have been used as references to be able to compress that image. Um, and finally, um, things that are called slices, which are basically the compressed output directly. Um, so it's basically the data. Um, and so a decoder usually will look like this. Um, so you have your video files here um, on the upper left. And you will see um, within the containers a video bitstream um, with each slice uh, containing raw data and are separated by separators. Um, and you take the raw data, um, 
yeah, decoding is actually a multi-step process. So first, you are going to take those raw data um, and give them to something that is called a bitstream parser, which is going to extract the metadata um, and the slices from the raw data that are stored in, um, in, that, uh, in that file. And so once you have the metadata and the slices, you will give it, give it to um, two different units. Uh, the first one being the controller that will take the metadata and uh, control what the decoder is actually doing. And the decoder will also take as input the slice so that it knows using the combination of those metadata and the slice itself, it's able to produce a decompressed frame that you are able to well, look at and hopefully display or whatever you want to do with it. Um, in most codecs, um, that decoded frame will also be used as input for the subsequent frames to be able to perform a decent compression. Um, and so, yeah, the decoded frame is also the input of the next um, frames to decode. Um, and so, um, <laughs> When you're looking at hardware decoders, um, so the ones that are found in SOCs or GPUs, um, most of the time, or at least in, in the past, they've been based on a design that is called stateful codecs. Um, and the stateful codecs are actually quite nice, at least from a programming model point of view, um, because you will just be uh, taking those raw data I was telling you about, give them to the codec, and the codec will have all um, the units that need to perform the job um, in hardware. So it will be, sorry. You will just give it the raw data and get back a decoded output um, without any more intervention from, from your part, um, which is very nice from, um, yeah, a programming model point of view because it's quite simple. Um, but from what I, heard, uh, it's actually pretty difficult to get right in hardware. So most of the time you will have, the hardware will be more complicated, you will have to have firmwares in place that you will have to develop and so on. So it has been replaced by uh, some kind of a new design um, that is called stateless codecs. Um, um, and that we are going to talk about later on. Um, so if we wanted to talk about, uh, if we wanted to support stateful codecs um, in Linux, um, the API that we need to use and the framework that we need to use is called V4L uh, for Video for Linux um, 2 in particular. And so Video for Linux 2 has been introduced quite a while ago, so in 2002. And it's basically supporting everything related to video in Linux, as its name suggests. Um, but it's not about only the codecs. Um, it's also about cameras or uh, DVB um, receivers, um, this kind of devices. So everything that will produce or consume video in, in Linux. Um, and so, yeah. So video for Linux is using some kind of a sub framework that is called M2M for memory to memory in order to support those kind of stateful codecs. And uh, if you're looking at a very dumb uh, pipeline using V4L, you will be having an application that will feed a V4L2 driver, um, the raw data buffers that we were talking about, and we'll get back um, the decoded pictures um, as soon as the decompression is done. So that part is pretty simple. Um, the only thing that is a bit um, an intuitive at least in my opinion, is the nomenclature of the um, cues and the uh, whether output and capture are actually output and capture. So it's actually seen from the user space application and not from the system itself. So for example, the raw um, data that you are going to put inside the codec for, de uh, for, um, for decoding is actually your output and you will get back your um, decoded frame using the capture interface, which is kind of weird to me, but yeah, anyway. Um, and so, yeah, if we wanted to support a stateful codec, um, we would have something like this. Um, the application or 
possibly using libraries and frameworks and so on, um, would take the bitstream, um, split those frames um, at each separators, feed the data to the, to the stateful codec, and get back the decoded frame, everything is fine. Um, and this is actually working quite well. Um, I, so basically every codec supported in Linux these days um, is a stateful codec. Um, so for example, the Baileybrick guys have been doing some great work on the AM logic SOCs recently. Um, they did, for example, a great talk at Embedded Recipe like a few weeks ago, and they were talking about their video codec. Um, the video codec on the AM logic SOC is actually a stateful codec. It's decoded, you have plenty of support in the user space um, libraries, framework, and, and so on to be able to use it. Everything works great. Except when you start to introduce the video codex, uh, the stateful codex, which will only have the decoder part in hardware. Um, and so everything else, so the bitstream parsing, the controller, um, and uh, storing the decoded frame and so on so that the decoder is able to do its job, has to be done somewhere else. Um, and um, so the design decision has been that, um, especially the bitstream parsing had to be done in the user space um, because the bitstream is basically um, a file coming from somewhere else that you basically cannot trust. So being able to parse that file um, in the kernel um, is quite first difficult. And then you have whole kind of security issues um, that you cannot prevent uh, or um, would be difficult to prevent. So the decision has been done to have the bits from parsing um, in the user space. And so you have to kind of split everything apart. Um, and it's especially more difficult with V4L because um, between the controller and decoder, you have to pass all those controls to be able to like, tune the decoder so that it's able to um, decode that frame properly. Um, and um, so you had an API for that, um, and a, a list of IOP tools that were able to do exactly that operation in V4L2, except that you had, it was completely separated from the buffers themselves. So you were able to change the controls, um, but you were not being able to synchronize that to a buffer. And so in this particular case, you have to change exactly uh, the controls uh, in lockstep with each buffer so that the decoder is able to do its job properly. Um, so there's been some support, um, some work at least, uh, for quite some time on something that was called, that is still called um, the request API, which is basically an API that allows you to uh, combine and have those control change in lockstep with the buffers themselves, so being able to be a, to do just that. So the first RFC was sent in 2015. Um, and then it basically hopped over a few people um, because it was also something that could be used for cameras, for example, um, to be able to, so for cameras, um, for example, changes, changing the exposure of a camera is, shows basically the same issue. Um, so when you change the exposure and capture some frames, you have no way, at least at the moment, um, to say when, at which frame exactly the expo exposure had been changed, which is kind of an, an issue as well in some use cases. Um, so the API went back and forth uh, between the codec use case uh, and more the camera use case over the years um, with a bunch of people stepping in uh, to help and try to address it for their particular use case. Um, and yeah, the codec side at least was finally merged in, well, what, would, what will become 4.20 or whatever it's called. Uh, so at least now we have support for stateless codecs, or at least an API that allows us to support stateless codecs in V4L2, um, which is great. Um, and so if we go back to the uh, stack that we were discussing before, uh, no, it looks kind of like this. Um, so you will still have your container, your video bitstream, um, your raw data that are going to be fed um, and passed by your application, which will then um, 
feed the slices uh, and modify the controls using the whatever are coming from the slice and the metadata um, to your V4L driver, which will in turn give you a decoded frame um, that you will keep so that you can use it as reference for later frames um, and so on. And so only the decoding part is now in, in Linux and everything else is in at least user space. Um, yeah. Um, and so we've been working that job mostly on all winner SOCs. Um, and so all winner produces multimedia SOCs that are mostly targeted at tablets and STBs. Um, it's one of the SOCs that are very likely to be found in those cheap, cheap SBCs um, that you are finding at like less than $10 on Alibaba, for example. Um, and uh, so just like any multimedia SOC, they have a hardware unit to be able to decode and encode um, videos, except that it's using a stateless codec. Um, so we had to have uh, that particular design to be able to use it. Um, yeah. And so OWINNER is giving like all the ARM SOC vendors um, a BSP stack. Um, and in the case of OWINNER, it's kind of an outdated one. Um, so the kernel that they are shipping is actually either 3.4 or 3.10, even these days, which is pretty old. Um, and for their particular um, hardware codec, they are not using V4L2, um, but they basically have some kind of private API, um, and it's based on a stack that is basically split in two parts. Uh, where you will have a kernel driver that is uh, basically just here to manage the resources, so adjust the clock to be able to get interrupts, uh, memory map the registers of the unit, and, and so on. Um, and all the logic will actually be in user space. Um, and that part was closed source for quite a while. Um, so we had basically no idea how the hardware was actually working. Um, and that kind of design would not fly with uh, mainline kernels. We, we were kind of stuck for quite some time. Um, except that there's been some reverse engineering effort um, that have been done on this particular um, um, driver, which is, so the hardware unit is called SEDAR, like the tree, um, and so the reverse engineering was called CEDRUS. Um, and so it was basically an effort to be able to have um, an, um, an open source stack based on to be able to drive that uh, particular hardware unit. And um, that reverse engineering was done for basically all the meaningful uh, video codecs in decoding, and then only H.264 in encoding, but it's not because um, they didn't have the time to do it, it's because the unit is actually only able to encode in H.264. So we basically had most of the codecs and features figured out, but, um, it was mostly targeted at all winners BSP, so it was just a way to be able to replace um, the um, closed source um, decoding part uh, that we were telling you about. And uh, it was still relying on the same API that all winner was providing, so that small um, kernel, um, kernel driver. So it was completely functional. Um, there's even been some SBC vendors that were shipping um, this um, reverse engineering uh, project as part of um, their BSP to their customers. Um, so it was completely working. Um, but uh, since the kernel was quite outdated um, and um, not really maintained anymore, um, it wasn't really a way forward. It was just a way to have a stopgap measure. Um, and um, we were not able to use it in mainline at all. Um, oh yeah, and they were providing as well um, a libvi depot uh, implementation so that you would be able to use it with popular media players. Uh, so libvi depot being an API, one of the API to be able to provide um, decoding capabilities to like regular um, multimedia players. So you would be able to use VLC and so on using that, that work. 
Though it was great reverse engineering effort, but like not quite enough for, for us. Um, and um, so at summer 2016, we actually had an intern for the summer that started working on that kind of um, driver and worked on an RFC. Uh, and considering that it was only about um, two, month things, two months, I guess, um, it was actually very successful. Um, so by the end of the months, of the two months, he had um, an MPEG-2 implementation working or at least a MPEG-2 decoding um, working and a LibVA implementation to be able to integrate uh, in the uh, popular media players. So I was telling you about LibVDPO. Uh, LibVDPO is basically the standard that is pushed by NVIDIA, I think, um, while LibVA is mostly about by Intel. And actually, the LibVA API worked better for us, so we chose to go with LibVA. Um, yeah, so we had basically some basic support for MPEG-2 decoding um, and some integration into the popular media players, um, but it was still really a prototype. Um, so you could have, well, we definitely still had bugs. Um, for example, we had frames that were backwards, so you had one frame and then the frame that was supposed to be af before that one was actually after, so it looked like some weird glitches. And it's actually because um, in video codecs, the encoding order is actually different from the displaying order so that you can compress more uh, efficiently. So you have to take that into order, and we didn't at the time, which led to some interesting bugs, or at least artifacts. Um, but the main issues were actually that um, um, it was really slow, um, so uh, we could only play videos that were at the resolution of the screen, um, otherwise it wasn't really working, actually on the displaying side. Um, so, and who cares about MPEG-2? I mean, everyone is playing H.264 and H.265's videos these days, um, so it was a great way to yeah, have a prototype, make sure it's working, but it was nothing more than a proof of concept. And for a year and a half, um, we've had a lot of people coming in interested into like pushing that proof of concept forward, but it was a significant effort, um, and we were not able to do it without funding, but no one really wanted to fund that um, effort on their own. So we finally had the idea to fund it through a Kickstarter campaign um, that started at the beginning of 2018. Um, and it actually worked great. It was the first time for us that we actually even tried um, or even considered um, doing a Kickstarter campaign to fund mainline development. Um, and we achieved our goals um, even uh, beyond what we were expecting. So we had even committed to um, Develop the drivers for more SOCs than we were intentional, um, initially intending. And um, we committed to develop H.264, um, H.265 um, decoding. Uh, and it allowed us to fund a full time intern for six months, um, plus a part time engineer. So the full time intern being uh, Paul Kosielkowski, and the part time engineer being me. Uh, and we basically built on top of the prototype. Uh, to be able to, well, work on more SOCs, reduce the number of bugs, obviously, um, and um, try to work on the slowness issues that we were seeing. Um, and, yeah. and so um, here is what the server stack is looking like. Um, so um, we have the bitstream parser that will actually be part of the video players or video frameworks, so things like VLC, FFmpeg, and things like that. Um, we will get from the video player um, the metadata and slice that have been passed already, and they are given to our LibVA implementation that we called LibVA before L2 request. Um, and it's actually because um, things that API is pretty generic, uh, and the LibVA API is pretty generic as well, it can be made to work on any stateless codec that we need to support. So it's some 
generic piece of code uh, that has been tested on, an, on a single SOC so far, so it's probably not generic enough yet, but should be generic. Um, and, we ha and we have a V4L2 driver that is made uh, for a particular um, Cedrus um, driver. The video decoding actually works. It works pretty well. Um, but actually where we found them, what we find the more difficult was actually displaying that decoded frame. Um, so in an ideal world, um, and it's basically what Cody is doing, um, you would have um, the Linux kernel with the V4L2 driver that we have, um, our LibGA implementation driving the decoded, um, um, driving the Cedrus decoder, um, so giving it um, the bitstream and getting back on the, decoded, um, the decoded frames, and then Cody would take that decoded frame, give it to the KMS drivers that we have in the kernel, and ta-da, everything is displayed. Except that. Um, so um, the decoded format is actually in a proprietary format, um, which is not that difficult to guess. I mean, it's, um, so it's a YUV tiled format. Um, and actually, most of the um, hardware engine are actually outputting some variant of a tiled format somewhere. Uh, and it's actually because it's more optimal in hardware to be able to work like that. So they basically all do. But the exact tiling, so the tiling in both directions are basically always different from one vendor to another. So you have to figure, out, figure it out. Um, but fortunately for us, uh, the, displaying, the display engine is actually able to process that proprietary format without any conversion. So we can just take the video decoder output and give it to the display engine, and everything works. Um, another issue would be that um, the scaling also, so that you can, well, upscale or downscale the video to um, match the one of your screen is, um, is not doable prop um, easily. Um, so we could just use, once again, the display engine to be able to use, it, it actually has a hardware scaler, so we'd be able to use that scaler to be able to upscale or downscale without any performance hit or anything. It's basically completely done in hardware. Um, but X11 doesn't allow you to do that easily. Um, so we basically hit a wall there. Um, and X11 pretty much expects that the format is not tiled, um, and it doesn't have any kind of hardware acceleration for scaling. Um, so yeah, it didn't really work for us. Um, so we tried a number of solutions. Um, the first one being, well, let's convert that tiled format in, in software. Um, so it's actually very, very slow. Um, so on small resolutions, it's actually it kind of works. So for example, for 480p, it's good enough, except that when you start um, coding higher resolutions videos, it just doesn't work anymore, and it's kind of taking all the CPUs to be able to decode your videos, which was kind of the point of using, well, kind of the point of using hardware decoding was actually to offload work from the CPU. So if you're using just as much CPU, then it doesn't, it really isn't worth it anymore. Um, and then X11 has a, an extension that is called Xvideo that is meant to be able to kind of uh, um, accelerate this kind of um, this kind of issues, uh, except that when we started reaching out, for example, to VLC developers, they were basically starting that it was stating that it was completely deprecated and they would remove it in the next release. So they didn't in the end, but it didn't really look like a way forward. Um, and we would have had some glitches as well. Um, because in X, all the composition, so the layout of the various windows, transparencies between them, and so on, kind of expects that X owns all the buffers. Um, and X video would take one of those buffers out of what X is expecting. So we would have had some issues, for example, with transparencies and so on, um, which wouldn't really work. 
Um, so we tried something else. We tried to import the decoded format in the GPU and do the um, untiling and scaling in the GPU itself, except that we are using a Mali GPU, which for now is not really supported quite good enough um, in upstream, um, in open source drivers. And the OpenGL blob has a lot of constraints, including the one that it cannot really just um, work for us. Uh, we had some kind of weird bugs when we were trying to use a shader to be able to do that untiling with like lots of precisions on the tile edges and, and so on. Uh, and we actually have some quite um, low memory bandwidth. So if we can avoid having memory coming back and forth between hardware units and the main memory, it's good. Um, and then we considered Wayland as well, which was, uh, which is supposed to actually be able to um, deal with this kind of issues, except that um, we would obviously leave all of our users using X11 um, in the cold, um, and then we would have to patch all the Wayland compositors to be able to support of our, um, our proprietary format, which doesn't seem really ideal either. Um, yeah. So um, what the current state is, is basically the request API has been merged in the next um, kernel release. So thanks to Hans for that. Uh, we have a libva implementation that is working in top of it, on top of it that supports MPEG-2, H.264, and H.265 decoding. Um, we also developed, um, as part of our driver development effort, some kind of tool that is called v V4L2 request test that basically will, um, will play a video that we captured, um, so basically a libva kind of session, uh, and we can just replay it over and over time using the just that tool and the kernel itself, which is quite nice when you want to just work on the decoding and you don't care about all the rest of the user space tag that you want to integrate into. Um, and we have the first part of our Cedrus drivers that has been merged in 4.20. Um, so it only supports MPEG-2 for now, but we have H.264 and H.265 patches that have been sent. Um, and it has been merged in staging for now, uh, because um, the, since it's pretty much the same, the first user to use that API and that API is quite new, um, we actually wanted to be able to um, change that API if we want. And um, well, if you want to do that, you have to be in staging. Um, otherwise, the ABI rules are kind of strict. So that's why we are in staging. Um, and I'll be doing a demo uh, I think it's tomorrow at the technical booth um, of this um, of this work basically. So with Cody running on top of um, our LibVA implementation and the Linux kernel um, decoding H.264 video. So if you want to uh, come take a look, uh, please do. So that's it for me. Um, do you have any questions? There's some mic on both sides of the... No questions, well, oh, one. So what's the user space port like in external libraries for uh, this kind of code? You, you mentioned it's, it's lib3a, but does FFmpeg have a shortcut or does, does it have to go through so, um, lib3a? We actually wanted to, so the end goal is actually to be able to have FFmpeg and GStreamer and so on be able to directly use a request API to talk to the kernel. Um, and our LibVA implementation is basically just a stopgap measure so, it's, so that we can have something working now. But considering that the GStreamer guys have been starting some work on it and so on, I don't really expect it to last more than a few years. Being, before being completely like, deprecated because FFM, FFmpeg will be able to talk to it directly. Good, thank you. OK, 
okay, there's no more questions, and I guess that's it for me. Um, thanks for attending, and yeah.